thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends, to episode 111 of the BJJ Brick Podcast. And I'm Gary, and I'm here with my uh, partner in crime, uh, Byron. How are you today, Byron? Gary, I'm doing good. Doing, I, uh, do, doing really good. Uh, had a great Thanksgiving. How about yourself? You know, Thanksgiving's always good. Uh, what else can you ask for besides a holiday where you can eat as much as you want? So uh, uh, that's always good. The one bad thing is... I was hoping to get like a pre-Thanksgiving roll, like a roll Thanksgiving morning, not a not a dinner roll, because <laughs> um, <laughs> I had a bunch of those. But I was hoping to, uh, to get out on the mats, uh, get a little bit of sweat going. But I I did not did not happen. So you, you uh, know, with the uh, with the time change, we remember to set your clocks back an hour. You know, with the Thanksgiving, remember to set your scales back ten pounds so you don't gain any weight. Oh, good call. Good call. Yeah. That's awesome. And while you're setting your clocks or clocks back and your scales back, don't forget to check your uh, smoke alarms. Uh, that's <laughs> a friendly tip. Smoke detectors uh, save lives, Gary. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Uh, but yeah, hey, we got a great episode here on episode 111. Uh, we have an interview with uh, fourth degree black belt. Michael Padeda, um, fourth degree black belt from Miami, and uh, definitely want to stick around for that. He's going to uh, uh, definitely help our games uh, get better. He's going to help us out, and uh, it's going to be an awesome, awesome interview. So don't miss that. Yeah, good times, and and he uh, he was friends with with my uh, coach Andre Montero uh, back when they were little kids. So that's that's kind of a neat little fact, and it's interesting to see people who uh, started something as children grow up and become. Uh, you know, professionals it's at still, this, yeah. It's still doing it. You know, you think about the dropout rate in this sport, and here's two guys who were both, uh, you know, very high level black belts. Uh, you know, when they were kids, they were doing it and uh, still doing it today. And we could probably interview them both in 20 years, and they're still doing it. So that's uh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, and and there's probably some some school somewhere in the country or in the in the world where there's two little kids training, and they're going to grow up and 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 be. Uh, at the top somewhere, you know? Yeah, because you think most of the time I do most of my hardcore sparring in the kids' class, so I probably don't <laughs> know a lot of those guys. That's true. You, you're gonna, you, you probably have even tapped out some of those kids. Well, I don't know about tapped. I've tapped to them. Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. My game's a little weak, and that's why I stick, uh, stick in the kids' class. <laughs> but uh, we're happy to bring you this 111th episode uh, this week. Um, Chugging light right along. I mentioned to Gary before the podcast, my computer is on life support. Uh, I can't turn it off because it won't turn back on. I have to go through like a long process. It takes the better part of a half a day to get this thing to boot back up. So it's been on for a few days now and, and, uh, waiting to get some help from my, uh, tech savvy brother, Nathan here, who's, who sponsored the podcast in many ways, providing, uh, much hardware and, uh, software support. So, uh, hoping, hoping to get him in here pretty soon on, into the, uh, studio here. If you want to help out the show, uh, you know, and not, uh, come over here and fix my computer, but to send us a little bit of funds, uh, you could do that. Uh, the easiest way is to, uh, check out our audiobook. It's your first year in BJJ. And especially if you're in your first year of jujitsu, that's who we're really trying to help here uh, with the audiobook. Uh, help you find out uh, where you should train and, and kind of some tra- training ideas and how to train safely and get you past that first year of training. And so many people don't make it uh, past that point where uh, they they get the full enjoyment out of it and they get the deeper understanding of jujitsu. After your first year, I think you're largely in part that the people stick with it. You know, it's it maybe the first few months are, are probably even tougher than that. So um, the audiobook is really designed to help people get past that first year uh, with its success and uh, and help you you know well into your journey of uh, jujitsu. Yep, and the audio book's just like one of our podcasts, uh, so you don't want to miss the audio book. You definitely don't want to miss a podcast, and a great way to not miss the podcast is to get on our email list. Um, to get on our email list, we have a link there on our on our page and on the show notes. Just uh, get us your email address. We'll send you a, a link to each one of the shows each and every week. That way you'll never miss it. Um, our disclaimer, we do not sell 
your name to uh, uh, mm-hmm. spam or any of the crazy stuff. We just uh, we just want to get our show out to people. So uh, that's really what it is. But a bonus, you'll also uh, we also have a Dropbox there on the email list uh, or on the show there, and uh, um, you'll get uh, free chapters of Byron's audiobook, your first year in jujitsu. So uh, you can even kind of check out a chapter or two on uh, on the audiobook and. Uh, uh, before you buy it, so try it before you buy it. Can't beat that. Yep, it. Uh, it haven't had any complaints about the audiobook. Maybe people, people who uh, are questionable listen to it first, and and yeah, the first uh, introduction and the first three chapters are now uh, in the Dropbox folder that's attached to the show notes. Um, yep. So, and what I would do is I would not wait for like the next fifteen years to go by till all the chapters are in that book because <laughs> you need it now, not in fifteen years. So check it out, support the show, get on our email list. Yeah, that uh, that's relevant because it, you know if you wait a year to to check out the audio book, you've you really kind of passed the amount of time where where the book would have been most beneficial to you. I'm sure you can still yeah. learn a thing or two from that, and and I probably learned a few things, you know, writing everything down and thinking about it. But uh, yeah, and then you know because you didn't read the book, you probably have dropped out of jujitsu. There you so, go. Yeah, so uh, probably not even listen to the podcast anymore. So it wouldn't be that beneficial to you. And that that makes me a sad, sad grappler, Gary. Yeah, we don't like it when Byron's a sad panda. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of sad pandas, it's time for the quote of the week. Which has Do we nothing... have a panda quote? No, but uh, pandas uh, have nothing to do with this quote at all, Gary. Oh, that was a but, quote. But a, a panda... Uh, is a panda bear is semi related to a polar bear? Probably not. I don't even know if a panda bear is. Well, they're so, both bears. There you go. And polar bears like it cold, and where it's cold, it's icy. And this is a quote from Wayne Gretzky. And the seven degrees of Wayne <laughs> Gretzky to pandas. I, you know, I, I can't listen to every podcast in the whole world, but I don't think there's one ever that's that's linked Wayne Gretzky to a polar bear or a panda bear. So here we go. Well, I can tell you this about to link me to Wayne Gretzky. My sister-in-law actually privately taught music to Wayne Gretzky's daughter. What kind of music? To be honest, I don't know, but she's a music teacher. Ah. Yeah. Very nice. So, yeah, so I think I got like two or three degrees to Wayne Gretzky. Well, why don't you uh, work your magic and get him on the show here, Gary? We'll, we can talk uh, jujitsu stuff, learning, you know, techniques and stuff. To Wayne, we can do jujitsu with hockey sticks. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, imagine those jokes. That'd be brutal. Um, so anyway, Wayne Gretzky uh, had a quote here. He said, a good hockey player plays where the puck is. A great hockey player plays where the puck is going to be. And I could think of this Easily in jiu-jitsu. You know, obviously, obviously there's no puck. But somebody could be playing in the moment and dealing with the situation at hand, and then another person can be uh, a couple of moves ahead and really really having things planned out. And that's a lot of times the difference between um, two different grapplers and, and, and the outcome. It will typically favor the person who's able to plan out their techniques a little bit further ahead. Yeah, I remember when you... You know, first started jujitsu, and you would just hunt one submission. You were just going, going, going. You know, tunnel vision for that one submission. And it was always neat when your game evolved, and you, you know, you would you would go for that one submission just to get that reaction. As that person turned into you, then you went for the choke. As that person moved another way, you hooked the arm, and uh, that was always my favorite. When I finally started getting a little bit better, and I started chaining stuff together, I would throw one move up there just to get a reaction and you know it's you're thinking where the puck's going to be you're thinking ahead of the game and that's that's when it really really got fun yeah that's uh that's a good good way to break that down and you get to experience that you know fairly early on in your jiu-jitsu uh journey is is as one's mission works sometimes it typically will fail in a similar way they're escaped the same you know in, in only a certain number of ways and if you could predict that think ahead you know and, and move on or have you know when you attain side control what are have you already set up their hands where you want them to be opposed to just get side control and then you're happy with that yeah you know you're you're like you said uh, you're setting stuff up you're always getting that guy in danger you know you may be in a safe zone a danger zone and then you may get the tap it's uh, you're just setting them up there for that but speaking of the safe zone in danger and tap 
I think we should get on to the article of the week. Gary, we, we, okay, I made a very nice transition from uh, Panda Bear to Wayne Gretzky. So we, how do you make this transition from safe zone to tapping uh, to our article of the week? Let me hear you make this. I already did, Mark. <laughs> Dang it, that was so smooth. <laughs> Man. Yes, um, actually, we have a pretty cool article, and Byron sent it to me here about an hour ago, and, you know, it's just a little graph that I just thought was awesome, but um, it's uh, the website is BJJ Greg, G-R-E-G, the person Greg dot com, uh, Greg's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu blog, and uh, he's got uh, his article on his blog from January 12, 2015, where on this chart do you spend most of your, your sparring time? And it, it's kind of a cool chart. It's got three different zones. Uh, in green, it's got the safe zone. In yellow, it has a danger zone. And right there, the bullseye in red is tap, the tap zone. And it's just kind of a, a cool picture to look at. And I never really thought of it that way. But you, you can almost change it however you want. You can have a if, – if you're a higher-level jiu-jitsu guy, you can make that – uh, safe zone really big. You can, uh, you know, play your top game. You can, uh, you know, just smother somebody, just keep position and make that safe zone really small where, or really big, I mean, where you're never really in danger. Um, the danger zone is small and the tap zone is small. Uh, or, or you can change it around. You can, or the new guy, somebody is just starting. It's going to be almost all danger and all tap. You, you think about it when you're first starting. You, you don't really know what to do. You, you're exposing your arms. You're reaching with your arms. As you're moving, your neck's coming up. You're, you're putting yourself in danger. Um, so it's kind of cool. You can, however you want to train, as you get better, you you can make the, the, the safe zone smaller or bigger, depending on really what you're working on. And But I never really thought of it as in graph terms till until uh, Greg put that up there, and I, I, I think it's awesome. I think it's genius, and, you know, simple but genius, and I, I really do like that, his graph, his picture. So, uh, Greg, good news. You get that coveted uh, genius award from Gary. He awards one every year, and usually towards the end of the year, so uh, we'll be sending that out to him shortly uh, for this article. And would that be a BJT brick patch? Uh, if, if he sends him an email, absolutely I'll send him a gee patch. Greg, if you're listening, send us an email at bjgbrick at gmail.com. We'll get you out of patch. Such such a great article. He color-coded this thing. It's green is safe, and then inside that's danger is yellow, and then red is tap. And he kind of in, – in the, in the picture below that, he's got the green zone is huge. It's, it's, it's basically destroyed that yellow zone to where it's, there's just a little sliver of yellow of the danger – um, of the danger zone and what that has done is you play very safe most of the time but that yellow zone is so short for you you don't play that very much it goes right from yellow to red so you're used to you're used to winning all the time you're used to staying very safe very tight game you don't play very much and you're not putting yourself in much danger but when you do get yourself in danger you don't have success getting out of it and you go to tap usually because you're not training that situation Either your, your training partners aren't able to put you there, or you're not you're not uh, training in a way that where they that they can get there um, with with you maybe playing with them a little bit more. So you know you could be you could be a, a great black belt and you're starting by white belts or blue belts, and they never can mount you, and your mount escapes might be pretty lacking, and you and you really wouldn't uh, get to work on those much. Um, even with the lower belts, I mean, it's still going to help you. But if you could put yourself there on purpose, get that yellow zone, the danger zone, to be a little bit bigger, it's going to help you uh, escape those situations and then avoid going from, like, the safe green zone, nice and big, okay, in the yellow zone, I have no idea how to get out because I never do it, I never need to be here, and then boom right to yellow, or boom right to red. I need to get my booms right. Yeah, yeah. you got to have the booms right. <laughs> Does that make sense, Gary? Yes, it does. Boom shaka like a boom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to end every sentence for that. Oh man, yeah. But you you, you have to train. I think in in both. You know, you have to have the the big green, the small green. You, you have you have to have that top. You know, the smothering uh, tight game where you're not in danger. You know, you're just smothering somebody. You're controlling position, but you, you have to put yourself. You know, in the in the very danger part, you have to be able to, like you said, you, hopefully you have training partners, even if you're 
really giving up positions that can that can make you work. I mean, sometimes it just doesn't happen. You, you may be such a high level. You may live in an area where there's you don't have a lot of high level training partners. It makes it a little bit harder. But you can still always expose arms, expose your neck, uh, start rounds with somebody in a guillotine and try to escape. So uh, you can you can always put yourself in those those bad positions and and basically get out of escapes. But I like the very last sentence. Where do you spend most of your your time sparring? Where are you at? It's uh, basically what do you need to work on? Where do you need to be? Yep. Sometimes we have to take that highway into the danger zone. It may not be as much fun, and and your 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 sparring session may not go as well. You probably get tapped a few more times every month, but uh, spending that time there will help you be uh, a smarter, more defensive grappler uh, when you're in a bad situation. And I noticed you had the Kenny Loggins reference: we highway about? into the danger zone. What are you talking about? Uh, Kenny, Kenny Kenny who? Kenny Loggins. Is that a movie? You need to put that uh, <laughs> when you said "Highway to the Danger Zone." You should. We need to uh, edit in. Uh, the song right <laughs> There's a song out that I made that up, Gary. That's a really clever thing that I just invented. Yeah, no, sorry, somebody beat you to <laughs> Dang it. Dang it! Namely, Kenny Loggins. I had I had the guitar part already written and everything. Yep. <laughs> Man, you, okay. you need a time machine and a hot tub. <laughs> So uh, that's it's a fun article, and it really makes you think about how you're developing your jiu-jitsu and where you're spending your time. Uh, BJJ dot or no, BJJGreg.com, and then this article is titled "Where on this chart do you spend most of your sparring time?" We'll put a link to it in the show notes, of course. And thank you for Greg for writing such a, a great uh, award-winning. As, as I called it, a genius article. There you go. So. I can't wait to see who Gary's going to give this award to next year, but Greg's getting it this year. Way to go, buddy. Yep, Greg's got it. I think it's time uh, for, our, or for our interview of the, the week. When do you think so, Byron? Yes, I do. It's uh, Let's go ahead and uh, get our interview with Michael Padeda. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. He credits most of his wins to maintaining eye contact with his opponent. His gi never smells, even after rolling with the stinky guy. He is often seen riding a unicorn to open mat. When he got his white belt, black belts traveled for hundreds of miles just to roll with him. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick podcast. Stay sweaty, my friends. All right, my friends, I'm happy to bring Michael Pedeta to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Michael, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate the opportunity. So I hopefully we can, you know, help out the jiu-jitsu community, you know, like, um, and then answer some questions for you guys, you know. Whatever I can do to help, it's going to be a benefit for all y'all. Wow, I, I really appreciate that, and I uh, I definitely appreciate your, your focus on wanting to help people uh, with jiu-jitsu, and, and that's uh, something that will go well with this community. Uh, the audience does expect, you know, they they always love to get good advice from somebody, and you're somebody that will deliver that. Can you just, just tell us about yourself a little bit, uh, Michael? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, well, I, I do have a, a, a little bit of a... A little bit of curiosity in my life. I started in judo as uh, I was a five years old. I was a very hyper kid uh, in my neighborhood in Brazil. Uh, I did judo for about like two, three years uh, in Laranjeiras. It's a very, very charm neighborhood in Brazil. Whoever, it's actually nearby the, the, the Christ. So whoever has a chance to meet Laranjeiras is a great neighborhood. I have a lot of you know, passion for that neighborhood. So I ended up doing judo for like three years. I, I remember that I graduated uh, blue belt three stripes, I guess. And then uh, since my, my 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 dad was a doorman, my mom was a maid at that time. I, I do have a little brother, Marcio Porfirio Pereira. Uh, he's four four years younger than me. Uh, I always looking for uh, activities, you know, like, and in Brazil, you know, the first activity, like the parents, they give it to you is a ball. So you're going to be a soccer player no matter what. So um, I kind of like, you know, I was 
playing soccer, but at the same time, I like the martial arts. I try to stay attached to it. So I stopped martial arts for a couple of years. Then I moved to Barra da Tijuca, which is a great, also, like, very long coast with a nice surf spot. And uh, as a matter of fact, I, I have my mom here, Mrs. Zélia Porfirio Pereira. My mom actually told me that I stepped in a couple of jiu-jitsu classes with a great, well-known black belt from Brazil, Renan Pitangui. So Renan Pitangui was famous for, like, his base when he dropped a pipeline. Uh, well, famous, right, for Hawaiian surf spot. He, he was like a crab, you know, like he put a very low, low base surfing. And then I, st- I did a couple of classes with Renan Pitangui, but uh, I was a little young. Uh, and then, uh, as a matter of fact, we have to move it again. You know, my dad was on the contract, so he always looking for a better contract. And then about at eight, at uh, 12 years old, we end up going to Leblon, which is, that's my, my, my home, pride neighborhood that I, I love it. Leblon, it's a very family oriented neighborhood. And then what's happening, uh, I did, you know, I did a couple of karate classes with uh, my, my instructor, uh, Paulo Góes, which is passed away, unfortunately. And then uh, in, uh, when I was age as a 15, I met this great two phenomenal people, which is I have lovely care and compassion for them. I love them, which is Francisco Toku Albuquerque and Rodrigo Medeiros, you know. And as in Leblon, you know, you were surfing here, you play football there, you playing different sports and activities. So I end up like, uh, you know, got invited for them, you know, uh, to go to Carson Gracie headquarters in Copacabana. But at that time, you know, you're a young age and you, you, you more like nearby your neighborhood. You want to do everything in the neighborhood. So I never have a chance to that momentum actually go with them. And then a week later, I was with a friend of mine, another black belt from Nova Geração. That's the school that they formed us. Yeah. Uh, they actually invite us to get opportunity to meet this amazing martial arts with jiu-jitsu. And the only reason that's Brazilian jiu-jitsu, because extra, actually, like, it was born in Brazil. And then, last thing that you know, man, I was doing these fantastic moves and sweeps. And back then, we didn't have so many brands of a geese and bells and <laughs> all the brands that we have nowadays. So, so pretty much like you were doing like a VHS uh, movie. Uh, and now you have a high definition movie. You like a fiber optic movie. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. you do it just one click and you can reach out to all over the world. So basically what's happening, I see myself like in the mats and back again in the gi. And uh, I was so happy and I was so bright. And I said, dude, that's what I want for my life. You know, after you do your first choke, after you do your first arm bar, and I feel like, wow, this is good, you know? So I was like thrilled, you know? I said, man, I, I wanted this from you. So I'm very grateful for that two taps on my shoulder when I was looking at the ocean and sit on the stairs and thinking about the, the next surf for the next day. And I have those two gentlemen touching my shoulder and say, hey guys, you want to try it out? We're going to open up a school next week. Uh, the mats are coming, and we, we're going to have a small class, uh, a, a great opening. And uh, back then, it was just me plus five, you wow. know? And, and I said, wow, man, that's awesome. Wow. That's that's cool. And uh, how so how old were you when you actually started uh, training jiu-jitsu? I was at age as a 15. Okay. And, and, and now where are you? Well, I'm I'm uh, I'm, uh, I'm gonna say you know like I'm uh, four years old, but I I feel like a little young. I keep my diet very strictly. You know what I mean? Like so, I try to stay healthy and stay yeah. in a good but, shape. That was, too. that was all Brazil. Although the young guns. <laughs> where are you located now? Well, right now I'm actually situated in Miami. Okay. This beautiful weather here, which is I invite every single one that uh, listen to the podcast right now to come play a visit. Friendly environment with uh, really good people, you know, uh, Miami. Uh, we actually move up to uh, a storefront. We're actually in a shopping center right now. The past two years, we've been blessed 
to be there. God provides to us as long as we work in the line of the truth. So basically, we located at uh, at uh, Burr Road and a 152, which is a Carlson Grace in Miami, which is the academy. And uh, I have my team, which is the Gold Squad BJJ team. That's great. And, the, and I'll put a, a link to your website there so people, if they do want to come check it out, they could get a hold of you pretty easily. Um, what, what is you have a nickname? How did you just tell me about your nickname? Oh, that that's the that's the part that uh, back then was getting me like uh, all different colors of the rainbow. Guess what? So guess what? So I I just moved into the blue, right? I was a young kid, and you know the last thing that you see it's a beach with uh, like a lot of good waves. So I said I'm gonna surf. So I was back and forth, didn't know nobody, didn't have any friends and stuff like that. And the last thing that I noticed, I see this big guy walking across the street. You know, he ended up give, be be my friend afterwards because I have to. I was smaller, he was bigger, so, and I, di- I didn't do jiu-jitsu that time. So I was just like surfing, soccer, beach soccer, whatever, right? So I was in the, I was in the ocean, you know, and having a good time, and then he has another friend. And uh, my big friend name is Paulo Ferreira. He actually was the owner of a bar across the, uh, down the street. And Marcelo Torrão, it's another friend of mine. They both looked at me and said, hey, man, you look like Buyu. I said, who the heck is Buyu? I said, Buyu, Buyu, who the heck is Buyu, man? I said, Buyu from A Praça Nossa. A Praça Nossa, it's kind of like a TV show program in the Channel 11 in Brazil. It has this, uh, this host, Carlos Alberto de Nobrega. And uh, basically what he does, he invites comedians to the show. It's kind of like a Saturday Night Live, you know, similar here in the United States. So he actually brings up the characters there, the comedians, to make jokes and everything related with Brazil, right? So uh, socioeconomical, political skills, and everything related with that. So last thing is, like, at the end of the show, right, he has this kid. And the funny, and the true story about this kid was this kid used to sell candies on the lights, you know, and every day on the route to the show, he was trying to ski and say, hey, uh, I mean, do you sell candies every day? I say, yeah, man, life is tough. I got I to gotta support my family. You know, that's how I, I get food on my plate, you know, like that's I have, you know, to feed my brothers and sisters. And I said, okay, how about that? How about I give you a, a job on my show? And you, every day, when I close out the show, you give them a message to the public, you know, related with education for the poor child or kids that are in, in need. And, and, you know, how you li- we, we would have to look it up to the educate the kids because the kids is the future. You know what I mean? I say, yeah. wow, sounds great. So you watch the character, and the character is, you know, a dark, light-skinned kid with the fuzzy hair. You know what I mean? And here we go. This is myself right here, and that's how the nickname started. So I was mad at it, you know, because I never saw this guy. This guy gave me a nickname for the TV character, and I have to look it up who that is, and I was mad. But, you know, life turns out really good, so I end up adopting the nickname. As a matter of fact, uh, I was a DJ in Brazil, and, you know, I started playing some in some uh, parties and nightclubs, and friends of mine, like Christian Sampaio, Marcelo Ara. So those guys, you know, was a, a circle of friends. They also do jiu-jitsu as well back then. And they started to invite me to go in, a, in different parties, you know. Oh, you got to put a, you got to put an artistic name, artistic name. I said, man, no, 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 just leave Buyu. And that I end up from hating the nickname to adopting the nickname. And that turns out good because blended into the jiu-jitsu, you know, it's a, it's a easy, simple nickname. And, you know, here we are. That's good, and it seems like a lot of times when people get a nickname, they don't like it at first, and and eventually they'll they 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 adopt it and it and it, and it fits. So that's funny. Um, yeah, I, I actually proud about myself because I, I heard some nicknames that are, it doesn't look too good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, could you tell me like a little bit about your style that you like to how you like to roll, how you like to train, and and, and maybe some of your favorite techniques? Yeah, well. I, I pretty much like I try to always copy my instructors. I always try to, you know, make sure I, I was doing exactly what they told me so, and uh, and not like trying to, you know, uh, do uh, deviate uh, the scenario of the classes. But uh, most likely, I, I like to I like to do a very playful game, you know, and I go with the pace of the student, of the guest, you know, or even the competitor as well. But I'm not, I'm not. 
I'm not a type of guy that's going to cause any warm or I'm not the type of guy that's going to roll with you and is going to try to crank your neck, your arm, your foot. You know, it's kind of like you got to be a very playful game in Jiu-Jitsu. You know, people need to go work. People need to be on your feet. People need to have a plenty wealthy to be able to, you know, live their normal life the next day. So, yeah, we're going to train hard. We're going to roll hard if necessary, if you're not. But in the meantime, like, I'm trying to make it easy, you know, and make the students understand the technique. I roll with all my students from white belts to black belts, you know, and if they got the technique right, I'll let them pat me out. I don't have no proud whatsoever because I think that you do a better, you do a better job when your students do a better technique. Why? Because if you don't let him feel the taste, how is to get an arm bar or a choke or a sweep, in the proper way, he always going to use extreme. He always going to be frustrated because it works with some people, with some people don't. And if you can canalize that synergy that he's bringing to you one on one, because that's the sport that we practice. It's a one on one sport. The magic is, hey, listen to me. Okay, you got me here, but you are putting too much strength over here. Why don't you turn over here, turn over there, and that's how we go for it. Favorite technique. I really like. The, the 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 leverage of the sport. I really like the sweeps. To the yeah. fact that you can get a guy with uh, 30, 50, 80 pounds heaven in you and you can ha- actually find the real, real balance of him and take him off of you. Because sometimes, even like, I, I put it as an example for my students, right, by, by. Uh When you roll with Ogi, uh, the, the technique is actually equalizes, you know, everything is the same level, you know what I mean? So you don't have no, no balance, you don't have no bass. It's a kind of like, it's a, it's a kind of like a music that you hear, like, it doesn't change. It's a one straight line, right? Because every, everybody's equal right now, because no gi. But when it comes to the gi, to so the fact that you have to learn the right technique to be able to it, and maybe uh, a, a higher level can get advantage to a lower level because now he, he know better, he know more grips, he know more uh, where he can put the hands and the body positioning, and no gi levels it up, you know. So that's how you have to really focus on it. Like, what's going to make you make this guy tap? But if the guy defending himself all the time, hiding the elbows, stuck in the chin, I mean, you gotta you got to really put a work. And then putting a work means you got to push in the face, and then you got to use more strength. But if you kind of, like, open it up, you know, like, Open your guard here and do like a Z guard there and do maybe like a half guard over here. Maybe he's going to open up for you and then guess what? Boom, you're going to get the submission. But in other words, like if you don't find a way to turn in, I mean, you're always going to be on the same level. So that's why uh, I like to roll with my students. I like to have them feel the taste to get a submission, get a sweep. Uh, and I like to actually go for sweeps as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, Tell me a little bit about your feelings on nogi. You mentioned a little bit. Do you train nogi uh, much? Or, or yes, I do train the nogi. Uh, my school it's a pretty much like a very uh, essential traditional with the gi. We do have like uh, out of the six days out of the week, we have two days out of the week nogi classes. Okay. We have a regular schedule. You know, we 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 train Monday through Saturdays. We sometimes we have a Sunday off, or with the BJJ addicts, we go over there on Sundays and we roll for like two hours. Or three hours <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, during the classes, it's basically our uh, uh, calisthenics, a uh, little bit of uh, uh, technique. Of course, a little bit of technique. When I say that, is a kind of like we focus on the technique as a drill. We go over and over and over and over, uh, about like 10, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, because since we have a different levels, you know, like people that need more help. Uh, they will get more help on the side, and of course with the monk the other students. And then we we actually go for the spar, for the grappling, for the live, what they call you know the roll. So that way, with that, I do my observations. Which type of technique my students from white to black felt they need to work for, maybe the next week, maybe the next month, or maybe the next three months, and then sketch it out the classes and to provide the opportunity to. A guy that doesn't know do the Omo Plaza in about two, three months, I mean, with the timing, he'll be able to do that. So, you know, in the same way as a purple belt, 
NATO, the omoplata, and as a brown belt do with the eyes closed, and the black belt do with the imaginary omoplata, and he gets you and he said, what the heck, you did it right here, buddy. So that's most likely what uh, what uh, what we handle for. Yeah, I do train in Ogi. I do train with my, uh, with my students, and I sometimes I go to uh, friends of mine that has a gym, and we change information because I think that's important. Do you think that if if a student uh, mostly does gi, is there a benefit for them doing a little bit of no gi? Does it help their gi game at all, or does it is it just if they just want to do gi and be good at gi, is it do they just always have the gi on? Well, but I think in, in my in my general opinion, jujitsu changes every day. Jujitsu yeah. is a constantly moving. It's a I, I call it's a kind of like a Rodrigo Medeiros one time told me, "Buyo, jujitsu it's an infinitive sport." And it is because uh, you, it's a little technique here, it's a little grip there, it's a little bit like positioning right there, it's observation that you do overall. A student that do train gi, absolutely, he's gonna do way better when he train no gi. You gotta regardless one big point that are some techniques like are, are more vast yeah. on the gi classes than the no gi, which is limited. Like I said it before. When you roll with the purple belt or a brown belt, or even like a, a maybe like a four stripes white belt, the guy coming like at least three, four times a week, and he's been dedicating himself. He's been paying attention on the instructor. He's understanding the technique, and he might be going to give you a hard time because he might be, you know, develop a type of skills that you're not used to it. You know what I mean? And we always got to respect that. We always got to respect the fact that. Uh, Whoever comes from Gi, of course, remember, you got to understand that back then in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 60s, uh, no Gi was just for valetudo. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, to the fact that some Gi are not even doing no Gi back then. The no Gi, I think, in my personal opinion, this is my opinion, and I think that's the way that I see it. The no Gi was created to bring more to the sports, to the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, uh, the wrestlers. The guys that go to high school and wrestle for the whole lifetime, and then, okay, guess what? I have a class suitable for you, for your kid, for your team to do so. And then, with a little bit of patience and explanation and, and, and understanding of the sport, they kind of like migrate to the gi classes. You know, as you see, sometimes you see UFC fighters or MMA fighters or strike force fighters, they do their whole life no gi. For many reasons, maybe they didn't have instructor, maybe the school is only focused in their memory, and all of a sudden you see, man, these guys are blue belt, you know, blue gi? Oh my <laughs> God, these guys are white belt? Oh my these girls are, what? And you see guys that have whole titles, like on the walls, belt titles, and the guys just like a brown belt. The guys are just a purple belt. But because of that, because maybe the skill level that he have with the no gi, it's not complementary for the gi. So he needs to adapt himself with the grips on the collar, on the belt, on the pants, and, you know, all of that. So then he's going to be able to perform, and I believe that, way better in no gi. Yes, practice gi is going to benefit you in no gi. It's going to get you faster. It's going to be you more aware because you don't have time to rest too much because you don't have time to hold it anymore. You know, it's just like moving back and forth. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's a, that's a great description, and it's um, thank you, my friend. It's 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 a good way to look at it. If if you're just doing uh, one, you know, you might want to at least think about the other one, and and maybe move over and spend some time doing. Uh, you know, if you only do an ogi, you might you know think about the gi, and there's a lot of value to it. And 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 and, and if you just do gi all the time, if you do a little bit of no gi, you might pick up a little bit of speed and and a little bit more explosiveness and and understand you, you know Absolutely. overhooks and underhooks a little better. Um, you mentioned that. Your style, you you've tended to, to uh, copy your instructors and try to be like them. Yes. Nowadays, yeah. with with YouTube and all that sort of thing like that, is it the same with, with your current students, or, or do they go out and they try to find stuff that uh, that maybe you didn't even teach, but 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 is good technique maybe, but something they they see online and they they try to emulate that instead, and, and how does that work out? Yeah, the way that I see, I was once again, I was very blessed to have Francisco Buqueque and Rodrigo Medeiros on my side. Yeah. And uh, uh, Francisco Toco was more well-known for his guard. He was a, a very, like, bottom guy. And Rodrigo was a top guy. So Rodrigo played top, and Rodrigo played on the bottom. So I have the two worlds right in front of me. 
So <laughs> back then we didn't have YouTube, Instagram, Facebook with the videos back and forth that you can do one click and wow, look at this 50-50. Wow, look at this warm guard. Oh, it looks like this reversal warm guard. You know what I mean? Like yeah. back then it was like go to class, listen to your professor and reproduce during the drill and try to make it during the, during the spar happen. So I have the both words like, right in front of me, you know. Nowadays, yes, with the social media, everything happens super fast. I am always vote for, I always vote for big time to any technique that I've illustrated in, in, uh, in a social media. As a matter of fact, I do have with the horrible, horrible English, and I'm still trying to progress my English as well, uh, a good friend of mine, Cam Primola, world champion as well. Yeah. He's located now with the Caio Terra Association. Uh, that guy helped me so much when I was in Philly, uh, I can describe. So he actually invited me back then in 2000 and, and, let me see, 2005 to make a series of DVDs. You know, it's, uh, you know, we, we make a couple of copies, you know, I, I'm pretty sure he still have it, you know, like, of course, maybe well, all the techniques over there is already like past, past that. And, you know, they have brand, brand new techniques. But uh, back then, like, I was fortunate to have him spending his time, spending his hours with me and help yeah. me out to put the techniques that I knew it on, on a small clips, you know, three minutes clips. And, uh, and he has even this website called Takedowns 101, which is actually was on YouTube. And I, I saw after like three, five years that I was in Miami, yo, you were the guy with the videos on the YouTube. I said, yeah, man, bro, nice to meet you. And I said, wow, I didn't know they would take that proportion. I just make a video to see if I help the jiu-jitsu community to understand how the technique was. Of course, like I said, my English was not that good at that time, but I pretty much see it, somebody watching the videos. Yeah. So the same way that you, nowadays you have even like big companies making nice productions and putting out there, I think all the techniques are valid, but in my conception, wait for your instructor, show the techniques so you can apply in class. So that way you show respect to him. You show that, uh, you know what? I know a uh, reverter omoplata but my instructor didn't show to nobody in class. But if I do with somebody else that doesn't know the technique, then we're going to have an injury. I, I'll tell you that. Uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate to always have my students on my side. They're, they're great friends that I have, the ones that are with me daily basis. You know, we always talk about a technique. I always explain it to them. I think, I think speech is important in class, so that way you make your students understand your philosophy. You know, I, I don't agree you just come in class for a technique back and leave, you know. And of course, like, you're not going to spend like two, three, five hours talking to people, you know, but if you can every day, you can see them with the three minutes talk, five minutes talk, explain why some moves are, are, are for certain belts, why some moves you still cannot do it because they have a rules and regulations. Injuries won't happen. I agree with that. Yes, accidents can happen. That's a different story. Yeah. Injuries, what I say is you did a technique that your professor did a show and the other guy doesn't know how to escape, boom, you have a problem right there because you have a guy that wants to uh, use the technique that he saw on YouTube on that day. But also... Uh, I'm glad that they don't come up to me. Hey, professor, because, I mean, I heard stories that the guy just sitting down over there. What are you going to show today? What are you going to show today? You know what I mean? So it's not like what you're going to show today, what you're feeling to show it today in class. Maybe you have a group of like uh, 20 students and you have one blue belt and you have the rest of a white belt. It's not going to be showing like flying triangles or flying arm bars. Work on the basics. <laughs> Maybe those guys you need the basics. Maybe maybe they need to get better in the how to prevent the armbar that this blue belt is killing everybody. You know what I mean? And maybe I don't know. Explain about talking about like a proper posture. You know, like little thing. Education. I mean, educate the students. I think it's the best key for you have a better school and have everything with the line set to. You know what? I'm a higher belt. I have a lower belt right in front of me. I'm, I'm going to try to use the techniques that he's supposed to be doing with me. And let me see how I go. Let me see how, let me see if I don't use the hook sweep and he tried to use the hook sweep and then I can, now I can use it. Okay, let, let me try that one. But uh, you don't try to do a hill hook or a full lock in a white belt to just 
because the guy just started like three weeks ago. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. He probably doesn't know how to pass guard. You know what? Put this guy in guard. Hey, man. Hey, you know what? Hey, buddy, come on, mount on me here. I said, what? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mount on myself. Get my back. Try to see. Well, let me see what you got. You know what I mean? Like little things like that. So that way you, you build a better class. And guess what? Students are happy. Teachers are happy. And everybody learned the technique right. That's great. You mentioned, we're talking a little bit about class structure. Do you have uh, beginners class, kids classes of different ages and, and advanced classes, or do you put everybody kind of together and, and work that way? How do you, how do you do your class structure? Yeah, I, I totally understand that uh, they do have uh, gyms and, and uh, big, big dojos that they, they have a possibility, maybe because they have more instructors and instructor and, you know, like they have more, more personnel to take care of that. But when I started, I, I just started like with a lot of, uh, actually my school here in the United States, in Miami, I have like six students and all their white belts. So it was easy to manage because everybody was a beginner. So I didn't put them to spar for a month. So since then, I was building and pile up their persona to wait for their time when they're ready. And then I'll put them to spar with somebody that knows a little bit, you know. And time, time passed by, I was be able to, you know, uh, uh, graduate a couple of students, and they kind of like understand the mindset that I have with respect with the other person. Because guess what? I need you tomorrow in class. If I hurt you today, you're not coming tomorrow. I'm gonna, I'm gonna drill the wall. Yeah. I'm gonna drill the wall. <laughs> I mean, it's not gonna make any sense. Oh, the choke is working here, but the guy's not tapping. I say, yeah, buddy. You don't have a partner because you hurt the guy yesterday. So basically, I do have everybody mix it up together, but I make sure that uh, uh, when I when I have my my assistants instructors in class, I divide the class for them. But most likely, uh, twice a week I cover like basics, and twice a week I cover advanced. But that doesn't mean that the basic students they can come every day. I actually recommend they come every day so they can see the technique that I'm showing. They're probably going to have a little bit more trouble, but then I can work them with the side, you know, and some of them get a really into it. You know, they end up coming every day and they end up understanding better on the technique which has been showing because, like I said, I try to repeat in the weeks or, or sometimes in, in two or three weeks the same technique over and over. One time a basic technique, one week like that, two weeks like that. Then the next time a, a, a little bit advanced technique, a, a technique that a, a blue belt should be known. A technique that a purple belt should you know. You know what I mean? And then the brown belt as well and the black belt as well. And, you know, they have certain things that sometimes uh, uh, the higher level guys, when they come from other, other schools and they try, to, they try to dive into it and blend into it, your program, they might be have, like, bad habits and you try to fix them. And that takes time because once, you got, once, once a student reaches out to a brown belt and a black belt, they already have his game set what he likes to do and what he's going to do. Yeah. But like I said previously before, 15 minutes ago, like with the YouTube and the techniques are going out there and then one technique maybe is now going to work for him on the next belt and then now we're going to change the game plan. So it's a kind of like one-on-one work with the, with the students that actually invest their time and money in competitions and tournaments and you try to make them be successful, you know. And all it's all related, my friend Brian, like related with uh, listen and understanding and, and, and agree with the technique that's been showing and the classes that have been going. Yeah. You meant, you mentioned a, towards the beginning of the interview that you, uh, you have a play a full style and you like to also watch the students roll and you kind of pick up what they might need to do and need to work on or maybe what they need to change in their game and, yes. and then you'll alter classes and, and try to help them with that. That sounds like a great way to, yes. to help your students develop. Yes, uh, just to put a, like a little parenthesis on that, it's not that hard when you actually in class on a daily basis because then you have like a student that has three stripes or you have a blue belt, brand new blue belt, or you have a a, 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 a relative purple belt that is kind of like fine his tune, and you just get one technique for each. Oh, that guy doesn't know how to pass card to his left side. Okay, guys, uh, next week, everybody's going to pass the guard to the left side. So he doesn't know it's probably with him, because you probably like see like three different guys on the same class, they only pass the guard to the right side. But then you get a guy south ball, guess what? You're going to be like in a in an alley with the no way to go with a seven feet tall wall and you have like three guys coming at you. 
How are you going to survive? How are you going to deal with it? Are you going to jump seven feet high? Or you know what? I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to go over to my fears. And, yeah. and that works in, a, in a, any ways. Like, uh, oh, I don't, I hate North South. Oh, yeah, you hate North South. Okay. A week passed by, two weeks passed by, three weeks passed by. Hey, guys, today we're going to do a North South skate. Yeah, everybody's on. You know what I mean? So you make that uh, plot be more easily to dilute with perception. And perception in this sport is the key for every single student to achieve what they're looking for. And that can be losing weight. So what are you going to do? So maybe like once in a week, twice a week, you put like a hard warm-up. Listen, we have 365 days out of the year, right? If a student come regularly three days out of the week, I guarantee you, I, I, I'm pretty sure, I mean, at least if it's sometimes somebody tell me, hey, man, you're totally wrong. If you get one day out of the month and you make a hardcore workout with a lot of calisthenics, a lot of shrimping, a lot of hip scapes, and a lot of, like, uh, bump and rolls and basics, basics, work on the basics, and then you do, like, two-minute rolls, it's not going to hurt nobody. It's not going to warm nobody. Oh, I came here to roll, like... 20 rounds, I say, dude, it's just one day, out of, one day out of the month. Every three, four, quarterly, you do like that, it's not going to hurt you. You know what I mean? So you can roll the other five days out of the week, the other six days out of the week, the other seven days out of the week if you want to. So you, you, I, I truly believe, bro, my perception is that you got to make suitable for every single individual so that way they can feel the taste of a uh, hundred and forty five pound guy doing like a phenomenal taking back take from half guard, which is a guy with two hundred pounds can make it as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. But then you give a little bit for everybody, you know what I mean? Yeah, it 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 sounds like uh you're you're teaching to to help each individual student get better and what they what they need to get get better at, you know. Thank you. And I thank you. And I, you mentioned that you know, like passing guard to the to the right or to the left, and why is it that some people have a hard time passing one way or the other? Well, I, I'm gonna tell from my experience. Everybody on the show that maybe listen and maybe like teaching you or have more uh, level of experience of myself, they might be gonna tip in. Oh, you know, I don't think that's. But I, I'm, like I said, you know, uh, once you invite me to do this interview, I'm trying to put on my perspective, my point of view of like what I what I see. Sometimes you feel you. Everybody wants to be in a comfortable zone, no doubt about it. Yeah. Right? Everybody gets the same route to go work. Everybody gets the same uh, uh, routine. Get the same coffee. Nobody likes to change it, right? Nobody likes <laughs> to change. It. Yeah. A few people like to change. Oh, you know what? Let me try this different route here. Let me try this different a coffee shop, let me try this different bagel just to see the taste. And then guess what? You you feel a different role. That's why injuries are, is going to happen less because now you're not forcing only your right leg. Injuries is going to manage your better because now you're not forcing your left side because now you manage it to play and to roll and to work both sides of the body and then you kind of like balance it's the same as a soccer player that he only know how to play with the right leg right what's going to happen his right leg after like 10 years is going to be like an incredible hook arm and <laughs> the other side of the leg is going to be like a little like i don't know like a chopstick that yeah. we get in, in a sushi place so that's why <laughs> I, I i try to Listen, remember, I, I'm not here to be the two of uh, of the whole world or the king of the hill. I'm, I'm not the type of person. But I think, like, once you have that perception that, okay, I think that guy's only play top, let me put him to play on the bottom until he dominates the bottom position. Oh, I hate play top. Yes, guess what? You're going to play on top. I hate play on the bottom. Yes, you're going to play. Oh, I only sweep for the left side. Oh, guess what? Through the years, after, I don't know, five, seven, ten years of practice or jiu-jitsu, you know how much is going to be your ligament sore from your right leg because you never told the left leg, hey, buddy, let's work together, instead of to be, like, only selfish to your ligaments, to your leg, because that's your right perfect leg side. So I don't, I don't, I, I don't think that's going to balance. In life, you need to have balance. You have to have time with your family. 
you have to have time to your friends, you have to enjoy nature, you have to be able to, you know what, let me play both sides. Or maybe Monday I play only on the left. Monday is going to be my day that's going to play only left. I'm going to do arm bar on the left side. I'm going to do a choke from the left side. I'm going to do everything to my left. And then on Tuesday, and that's called discipline. Sometimes discipline, that doesn't mean only come every day, having a wash key. I mean, those are, those are basics, right? You have to have a wash key, trim your nails, tie your hair, and little things like that. And but discipline comes to what you eat, how you how you behave yourself, you know, during, before, and after the fight, uh, how how you play your game during the fight, what are you doing right or wrong? Oh, every time I try to pass to the left, the guy blocks me this way, and I'm keep insisting, no, 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 stop, please, hey, hold up, I have a wall here, let me turn around and go to the other way. So I think that has to do with the student and daily basis or three times a week, two times a week, whatever, once a week. I have students that come once a week to my dojo, and I try to make that day as best as I can for him. That makes even better because then he said, man, I never would be able to sweep to my left side. And because you insist on me, now I'll be able to, you know, you know, fantasy a little bit here and drill a little bit there. You know what I mean? So I think that has to do with the student accepted that I got to get better. Yeah. You you also have uh, at your school some in house tournaments. How does that help the students uh, prepare for maybe a tournament that's not in house, or how does it help them develop as a martial artist? Well, man, that's uh, that's a key point for like uh, first timers. Uh, I call them first timers because um, it's. I mean, I've been tur- I've been doing tournaments since I was a white belt, you know, and uh, <laughs> it was funny because the first tournament that we have was against another school. It's kind of like an in-house as well. And I fought with this really tough guy. Uh, he was a yellow belt at that time. His name is Bruno. And uh, years passed by, he ended up joining uh, Nova Jurassic in LeBlanc, you know, my school. I wasn't there when he when he's when he ended up come, come back in training, but uh, I fought with him and I lost, you know. But uh, I was never like, oh, I don't know if I'm doing this tournament or not. You know, I always, I always vote for it. St- and actually, my instructor told me, oh, you have a fight for you. Uh, you're going to fight. And I said, what? Yeah, you're going to have an tournament. So it was kind of like throwing you <laughs> with the wolves. And yeah. I don't have no, I have only one spear and that's it. You know what I mean? So, but guess what? I never back down. And after that tournament, I said, when's the next? You know, and I lost. And I ask, and I actually ask him, when is the next? Wow! And God blesses me. And six months later, I was uh, no, I'm sorry, four months, four months later, I was a white belt, and I fought a tournament. As a, I, I, remember, I started as a 15, so until 16, I fought a tournament as a juvenile, and then they didn't have nobody on my divi- on the division and adult to fight with the two other guys, so I took the shot. So what ended up happening, I was, that time, uh, we didn't have no organization related with the sport, like IBJJF, International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation, which is like juveniles cannot fight adults and vice versa. That back then was like, was a jungle. You know, you go (laughs) with the wolves and that's it. You know, you try to pray to survive and doctors like far away and beyond. The only thing that you have is a a bag of ice and uh, mercurium and that's it, bro. Hey, you got to cut and put a Band-Aid and that's it. You know, you you didn't have like no cash or nothing like that. So I was, I'm never going to forget that experience. You know, Uh, 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 two weeks before my instructor showed me this technique. And I'm pretty sure, like, the Jiu-Jitsu community that is listening to your podcast, like, no, the Ezekiel truck, right? Yeah. And I got amazed with that, and I said, wow, I can actually use in my sleeves to choke with somebody else? Man, that's sick. I want to do that. So <laughs> I, I had I that key for me, you know, and uh, I'm there at the tournament, and I fought my division. I fought juvenile, and I lost. I got second place in juvenile. And then my instructor came to me, hey, boy, uh, we have uh, two guys in a dose division and don't have nobody from the team. You want to represent? I said, put me in. I said, they're a little heavy. Put me in. And now what, I don't know what happened. I think after my second loss, in the beginning of my jiu-jitsu journey as a white belt, I think all my butterflies on the stomach, all my anxiety, all my heart beat like 200 BPM per minute was disappeared, gone. And then I started to understand, dude, when you don't put 
when you don't put too much pressure on your shoulders, you fly like a roaming bird. You know, you fly far away and beyond and you can, you know, you don't have pressure. You just do that for fun. And that's when I realized the first two tournaments that I lost, I was doing for obligation because I have to do it. You know what I mean? But then the second fight that I have and I lost and I noticed, dude, it's an obligation. You just to go have fun. Guess what happened, my buddy? I went there and God gave me the, the blessing to win the two matches that I have with the adults. The guys are a little bit heavier. I don't remember, you know, remember my my neurons that time is too much jujitsu. Like I tried to get all the information connected, but the files are pretty much pretty much like organized in a different century. <laughs> yeah. I beat those two guys with the technique that has been showing the Ezekiel choke. And then I took first place and I said, Wow. I mean, look, that's amazing. I fought in one day, uh, two divisions, and I was be able to be awarded with like three, two medals, you know? So that's awesome. But because of the fact that I was trying to be very disciplined, you know, and uh, listen to my instructors and, and follow what they have to show to me and what the technique. And I, I think that's things that started. And the in-house tournament, which is I held, uh, every year in my gym is to prove to the, the new kids. I'm talking about three years old, four years old, even adults, even masters. They look, you're just going to use whatever you learn with somebody that is in front of you that knows the same jujitsu that you do. And it's a 50 50 fight, right? Whoever puts 1% more will be the winner. And Besides you put 1% more, because I have 50% a chance to beat you, so do, do you. So whoever puts 1% more, it's a gambling. So it's a, how, how, how much do you want? That's the question that you're going to make. It. If you have a challenge in your life, if you have a job interview in your life, if you have a situation that, how much do I want that spot? You know, and then the situation occurred that... Uh, yeah, I think that's a great experience because now you're doing something for the students with no higher cost in a way that they can performance. You can see them performance and everybody's happy. You know what I mean? We try to make the tournament as the way that everybody, you know, be able to get at least one or two match maximum. And guess what? It's going to prepare them for a big tournament when it comes to town and you're not going to be so lost. You know, you're not going to be, like I said, beginning, like throwing the, the wolves with the guy that has like 30 tournaments on his back yeah. and you only have half of it or none of it. You know, at least you did one tournament. So you're starting to control your emotions, your anxiety, your sensations of what a, do I really want this? And let me tell you, a hundred percent of the time I, I see this way, right? When you, when you get uh, frustrated for something that you did achieve, two things that's going to happen. Or you're going to strive for getting more and more and more and work hard, or you're going to quit. And most of the cases, 10 in 10 cases, everybody strives for happiness. I mean, the only that will quit will be the ones that uh, maybe listen to what the others will tell you. You're too old. You're ridiculous on that pajamas. Or what are you doing now? It's a pajama party. When you, got, you know what I mean? Little things like the silly things like that, which is should not happen. You yeah. know, oh, you know what? Uh, come by, try your jiu class. Oh, uh, why don't you come by and try like a, a tennis match? I said, what? Dude, uh, tennis match. I, I mean, we're talking about martial artists. We're talking about learning a curriculum. We're talking about learning a program. We're talking about going to a martial arts, going to a, a, a sports performance with the high intensity of every single person right there that takes up to 10 years to achieve the maximum ranking, one of the one of the the most dream about it, which is uh, you can go to school and graduate in four years. You can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer in four years. And we're talking about something that the monks they learned that we're talking about what the Japanese learning to defend their village back in the centuries way ago. So we learned something that was related to survive, you know, and the world that we live it's. You gotta, you gotta learn how to defend yourself. You gotta learn how to survive it for situations that are. Guess what, buddy? When you go camping and you're in the middle of the woods, you're not gonna use your jitsu, yeah. But if you don't have like a, a, a light or if you don't have like a piece of a, a knife or something, you're not gonna, you're not gonna see a daylight the next day. 
Yeah. I, you know, that example, if you go camping, you don't, you can't make a fire. Um, I could stay, I, I think just it helps me stay relaxed in a stressful situation. I mean, it's, I, I've, I've had people who I was, you know, stressed while the role was happening and, and I was in a bad spot. Staying relaxed helps, you know, if, if you can't get a fire going or if something Absolutely. at work is, is giving you a hard time and it, you're having a bad day. Staying relaxed and, and using your brain like you do in jiu-jitsu Absolutely. helps out a lot. So I think that's that's a big Absolutely. part of it. It's not just learning how to fight better. It's it's understanding yourself and, and what's happening and, and, and how you react to things and, and being, in, being in more control over yourself. Another parenthesis on this talk, and I'm sorry that uh, I'm, I'm sorry to the listeners and I'm sorry to you. I do talk a lot, and, you know, sometimes I, <laughs> I have to pace myself. Cause it's good. I, 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 Kind of like it's a kind of like a kite that you give it like the like the string and then all of a sudden oh my god uh, did I see my kite where did I go <laughs> you know so I'm a I'm a type of person that when I have a chance that a a good person like you that uh, I'm very you know, grateful to have you listen to what I have to say is like um, you know when somebody cuts you off you know when somebody gives you a bird or the guy looks at you with the you know, with the mean face, whatever, you know, yeah. it's ir- 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 irrelevant when you do jiu-jitsu. You know what I mean? Because there's so much power food than that. And that person actually needs more jiu-jitsu than yourself, buddy. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but um, that the, in, the, in the meantime, like you said, it's true. You know, like some sometimes we, we leave on the running day and then drop kids in school and go back and go work. And da, 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 boom, hey, hold up. I need more time for myself. Okay, you don't like martial arts, go meditate. You know, you don't like meditate, go listen to music. You don't like listening to music, go run in a park, go do something, burn some calories. Take the endorphin out of your system so that way you can be a better person the next 5, 10, 15 seconds or 5, 10, 15 days ahead. You know what I mean? Because, yeah, everybody looks forward to Friday, to party, to drinking, to go whatever, but guess what? Sometimes on Friday we have people grapple and sweating and you know, get each other on top and take it out and they are the happiest person on the planet. You know what I mean? Because whoever do not does jujitsu, they will never understand the people that are hooked in jujitsu. You know what I mean? That that uh, a sales online that which is gonna come out like probably like the next two weeks with the Black Friday with the gi that you're dreaming about it from $100 come to $50 and you buy like five of those and then your <laughs> wife goes crazy what the heck you doing with my crazy car I tell David I'm going to buy five but you have to buy sneakers. I said babe I need one sneaker I need one pair of sandals and I'm fine you know what I mean so little things like that but uh, you see guys that actually get addicted you know and, and I, I think like once you have control of your addiction related with Jiu Jitsu it's all healthy you know, sometimes you've got to pace yourself as well. You don't need, like, a wardrobe of these or showing off a wardrobe of these, you know what I mean? But uh, make sure, like, at least, you know, every if you're, if you're a guy that practices, like, you know, I don't know, maybe three times every day. I mean, every three months you get a new brain of geek because that, that thing's torn apart, you know, if you're training too much. But in the beginning, you know... You probably can handle yourself with one or two Gs, and eventually, yes, you can see a little uh, ads, the you know mouthpiece. If you're afraid to go to the dentist, little things like that. But uh, you you don't need to go crazy, you know. Uh, just make sure you, you have a, a regular life, a good lifestyle. Um, and if you have a trouble with uh, any positioning or any submission or stuff like that, you know, you ask the instructor or your assistant. I'm pretty sure. Any gyms nowadays, everybody help each other. Yeah. Anybody who has a school will see uh, a lot of people come in and, and try jujitsu, and sometimes they stick around and sometimes they don't. Um, yeah. Can you think of, if you see a, a, a pretty new student, maybe in this first month, and you notice yes. like maybe a personality trait about something, somebody, you know, like maybe yeah. their attitude or maybe something that they, uh, the way they behave or something, and, and you just know mm-hmm. that they're going to do good and they're going to stick with the jiu-jitsu. What would that be? What would the personality trait be that they would have that would make you think that they're going to stick with it and, and become good at jiu-jitsu? Okay, I'll, 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 I'll tell you based on, on the students that I have on my camp yeah. that have been coming right now this past, this past two months, right? I do have a good amount of young guns, like uh, age 14 up to 17. Yeah. That's and I good. do have some adults interested as well. So I see this way, right? An adult uh, depends on his depends on his age. 
Uh, most of them, they are interested in stay fit. Uh, first of all, they, they want to do some activities because they're already tired of going to gyms. Uh, or they did extra high intensity, uh, they did, a, they did a high level, uh, training and they might be, you know, poor muscle here or they kind of like, they didn't have the time and then they come to train Jiu Jitsu. So you gotta make like them understand because those are the people that are probably gonna stay longer now because they already have established jobs and they have established family. They have established house. They don't, they're not gonna move around, you know. Uh, the, 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 the young guns, the, the kids, the teens, they probably like having the parents drop off and everything related with the schedule time, you know. So I do invest my time in both individuals, in both characters, in the both sketches, right? What I try to explain it to them is the importance of the consistency of their training and the values that they apply to respect to the others, you know. Sometimes you do get a couple, a couple of like knuckleheads that are, they think like they're going to come on Monday, on Friday they're going to be on the FC and <laughs> things like that. That does not work. Yeah. So what I tell them is, first of all, they have to learn the history of the sport. So I give a little lecture, a little book. I give a little links for them to get the research. And then with that, they can have some sort of, a, you know, a tiny background. I say, listen, guys, you have five minutes to be on social media, right? Scroll down all the posters, all the pictures, whatever. Yet the next five minutes and read about the story of the sport that you're doing and why the reason that it's been so long, why the reason that we have the Bushido code on the wall. So make sure like you follow those duties, the loyalty, the respect, the dignity, you know, the truth, the honor. So that way you guys can, can be long time here. Now the people, the students that are a little bit like a uh, spike, so we're trying to have a, a good talk on the side with them and work with them to make sure, look, if you're acting like a jerk, it's not going to happen. You know what I mean? So yeah. you got to act with respect. So, and they're, especially because, and eventually you're going to be training with a guy that's maybe 10, maybe 20 years uh, older than you, maybe heavier, maybe lighter. So if you go as you go with a 20 year old, you're going to hurt him. You know what I mean? And this guy can be a potential person to be in the school for the next 10 years and get a black belt. So, but if you keep hurting him, he's not going to come back because, I mean, it's certain things that the professor can control. It's certain things I cannot. I cannot fight for nobody. I cannot get in the middle of the match and roll with somebody. It's not a, it's, it's a one-on-one match. What I can do is show the tools to be able to be music during the match. Yes. Uh, sometimes they get super hyped up because they almost get the arm bar, but they keep insisting and they want to get it, get it, get it. It's not going to happen. And 10 seconds left, five seconds left, time is over. So look, see, if you keep in moving yourself a little bit more and control your anxiety, it's not going to happen. You know what I mean? So most likely uh, the perception of to understand like what kind of individual that's going to come and is going to blend it in with the philosophy that you have in the dojo, that's going to be important. But I guess what? They has a dojo for everybody. Same as they has a girl for everybody. Same yeah. as they has a wife for everybody. <laughs> and they has everybody for everybody out there. Sometimes you're going to have people that are going to come to the dojo. They're going to say, I don't want to stay. And you ask me why. Um, let me see an example. Uh, uh, I don't like the color of the wall. All right. I cannot paint the wall for you, buddy, because everybody likes it. Oh, I don't like the mats. I don't like the geese. Uh, they're going to make an excuse to don't be at your school because they're not going to say, you know what, I'm, I can be part of the school because you guys are too rough, you guys are too nice, you guys are mild. I mean, I can't. Or you only have a white belt, you know what I mean? So certain things like that doesn't combine on our sport. You know, what combining our sport is to be humble and accept the things that God gives to us. You know what I mean? And, of course, like down the road, Everything can be relative, you know, like uh, if you got a better job or if you got laid off and maybe, you know, you can afford that gym and you're going to go to another one. But uh, we got to understand, you know, life is, is constantly changing. Everything changes and everything can happen and everything can change like the next hours and the next weeks and next months, you know. So you can get mad about it, the person that did not fit in on your club. You know, maybe it was not for him. Maybe he got to find another place that he's going to feel more that uh, I want that ground and pound. I want the elbows on the face. I want to get every day with the black guy. Maybe he likes that. Let him find a place that he's going to feel comfortable about it. You know what I mean? So that's the way that I see my friend. Yeah, that's that's uh, that, that's it. I think you're you have a, a uh, accurate 
description of what what somebody uh, who is going to join you. Jiu-Jitsu is going to probably uh, with a good attitude and and, and come in and be humble is it's gonna it's gonna go very far. Tell me a little bit about your sponsors and, and who's helping you out, um, helping you out with your gym there. Okay, um, Michael uh, Michael Fernandez, the owner of uh, AC Chills Air Conditioning. Shout out to Michael. Uh, every time that I have a, a in house tournament, every time that I have an, uh, anything related with the gym, he always helped me out. He always been supportive. He always been like upfront. Jovan from Equality uh, Mortgage Places, like he always also the same thing too. You know, he always been helpful too. And I was very blessed for the the past couple of two years that I have Tanya Subs. It's a it's a it's a restaurant. It's a it's a sub place here in Miami, which is I invite everybody to try it out. The, the Turkey Wrap, uh, Vanessa and Eric, they do a great job. They 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 cook so well and they are very humble. As a matter of fact, uh, since 2009, when we are holding the Miami Open here, uh, among with uh, IBJJF, which is I've been working for them in Brazil for many, many years, and they and uh, we always been trying to reach out with them and making sure like to bring the tournament here that I was be able to hold the staff. So I put them to be the the first one priority on uh, on the staff lunch. So Tanya Sub has been very supportive on that, and they 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 always help, you know, like. Uh, when 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 they see that you have a good 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 uh, good intentions, you know people will will be curious about it. And, and if they ask to the right person, and the person tells you, look, this is very simple. It's a black and white. It's a A B and C X Y Z. Hey, I want to buy the idea. What I have to do? And then you have like another support. So th- those are the people that are very helpful with me, and I'm very blessed and glad to have them with me alongside. You know. Yeah, that's great. And, uh it's nice that there's there's students of yours and and that they're they're doing that it just shows the the, the team that you have there thank you sir yeah um mo- um most most likely um i have uh, i have a pretty good uh assistant instructors as well Joshua garcia lazaro amaro many shorings jumping here and um and Michael Fernandez, the other one, I call him Tarzan. And uh, those those are the people that always, like, help me out, you know. I have uh, phys- assistance from Baptist Hospital, uh, Tom Lynn Jr. He's in my black belt as well. He's always there to help. Uh, Brian Hargrove, another black belt of mine, so he's always there. I actually have my pastor that trains with me that did my marriage, uh, Matthew Dubok, he's a brown belt. And uh, I'm I'm super happy to, to you know to have these guys and of course like if I tell all the names here we're gonna spend pretty much <laughs> the whole day so but uh, I, I like I said you know I invite everybody that uh, is willing to see our work see what we do daily basis you know hopefully like I can see one of those days that somebody wants to see the warm South Florida weather you know and I want to visit they're gonna be open arms. And uh, don't be scared if I come to hugging you because that's how Brazilians do. You know, we hug each other, <laughs> we, we, we grab the hands, we give a big hug. You know what I mean? So sometimes it can be a little bit weird, but uh, that's the way that we are with a big smile. You know, my friend. Yeah, yeah, and and Miami is a, a beautiful place to go if you looking yeah. for a place to visit. I yeah, definitely check check out the gym there. It, and one of your students has uh, Brazilian just who ranked bracelets with paracord. Oh uh, yeah, that's one. It's uh, it's uh, the ones that are we we actually put in more effort because he's just started. Uh, Alexander Bolanos, he's a blue belt of mine. BJJ Paracords is a it, it's a, it's a dorm. It's a product that uh, you know can complementary uh, like in your wrist, like your ranking of your belt. You know, like uh, so that way it's a very like so we're trying to make a. Uh, Styles different, you know, for classy, for rough, you know what I mean? Like, so that way we can actually reach out to the BJ, BJJ community with the BJJ Pet Accords. So just for you have a, something extra, maybe a gift to offer to a friend of yours that does jiu-jitsu and uh, he's already have the nicest gi, the best belt, and the hash card, the shorts, and mouthpiece, he has everything. Guess what? BJJ Pet Accords come to actually complementary his uh, jiu-jitsu ranking and, uh, you know, with that, we we trying to uh, build up a good relationship in the community world. So, 
Yeah, and it's uh, that, that's a great gift to give somebody, especially if Thank they're you. they're getting a new uh, new belt promotion. Christmas are coming! Christmas are coming! Yeah. New belts! New belts! Change your change, change your cord. Let's go! Let's support who support the sport. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome, and and uh, I'll put a link to the website is bjjparacord dot com, oh, thank you, man. and uh, and hopefully oh, some people you. that way because that's a cool gift to give to somebody and show. I mean, you could just give it to a teammate. You don't have to be, you know, just a fellow no, training no, partner. And, not at all. And, and and as a matter of fact, that like um, like I said, you know, like uh, you can do, and it can work in the, anyway. It's not just in jujitsu, but in, in other sport, judo, karate. Like yeah. of course they have a belt ranking system. You know, guess what? You can actually make a pre order. You can actually uh, as a, as a goodie bags for your students on, on a ceremony or little things like that. You can give it to them. You know what I mean? So it, it, it's suitable for every single individual. You know. Yeah, that's awesome, and and hopefully, uh, I, I think that'll be a, a good gift for people, especially with, like you say, Christmas is coming. So that's that's perfect. Yeah. Um, if somebody wants to <laughs> to visit you, let's say you know I'm going to Miami. How am I going to yeah. find you? Yeah. How are they going to what? How, how would I how would I find find you and get a hold of you to to, to train? Yeah, it's uh, very simple, right? So uh, most likely, uh, I I I pretty understanding that uh you know Miami when we're talking about Miami Miami Beach. Top number one in the beach in the whole world, ranking like I don't know how many years, which is a beautiful place to be, you know, and the most likely people trying to stay a little closer than that. So it's uh, whatever you come from, uh, Turnpike will be the best way, right? So you, if you're coming from north to south, you get off of, of Southwest 42 Street, which is the Bird Road, and you come like probably like driving in about like more 10 minutes which is actually gives you like just an idea if you look at in the south beach and you don't get out on a rush hour you know my classes at night the adults classes are 7 30 so if you leave south beach around five uh, you might even get a little bit of rush hour you know and you're gonna get in a little bit like if you're a good driver nowadays we have a, a, a service uh internet with applications that everybody can reach out and you know go for it and, you know, you have a nice limo to pick you up so everybody can choose and pick. Uh, you're talking about probably like a 40 minutes, you know, to my gym, and which is a 4033 Southwest, 152 uh, Avenue, uh, Unit 9, Miami, Florida, 33185. It's a Carson Grace Miami Academy, a Go Squad BJJ team. That's the, 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 the name that we choose all, chose on it. You know, I was like, I used to, I used to watch a lot of Mr. Machine. You know, that's why uh, you didn't ask him that. But the, the, whoever's gonna man, this guy has a ghost. Why do you have a ghost as a logo? You know, okay. I used to watch a lot of Mr. Machine, Shaggy, and you know, Scooby Doo. Yeah. So I was a young, you know, and then, and then I see those ghosts coming back and forth. I was, I was like thrilled. I said, Wow, look how funny is that a ghost here, a ghost there. So I came up to a friend of mine. Uh, Fernando in Brazil, and I said, uh, I don't know. Ricardo, Ricardo Ribas, Ricardo Ribas, that's the designer, the first designer that I have, right? I said, Ricardo, look, uh, I started to teach a class in Nova Geração, and you know, back then I was a blue belt, and remember, like back then I was didn't have, no, only a brown belt can teach, only a black belt. No, we were trying to help each other out and during the gym, you know, like I was teaching a couple of classes here and there to help my instructors build the program, you know, so, but I didn't have a logo, and then they said, wait, why don't you make a logo? <laughs> I make a little logo for myself as a funny way just to have it. No with temptations at all. Regardless, I never told one of my students in class to wear my logo. It's just for me, you know? And became like a, became like a trademark in the United States because now I do have my gym and, you know, I still have my, my instructor's Nova Jirasani BJJ Revolution logo on, on my kimonos, you know, because that's where I come from. That's the lineage. That's the path that I came from, and I and I make sure I give it this very strictly to my students. The lineage that you learn, I learned from Toko, which is Nova Geração owner, and Rodrigo Medeiros, which is a BJJ Revolution owner, and they both are, came from Carson Gracie. So it's a Carson Gracie, both of them and myself. So the lineage that we follow, the style, the way that we train, the philosophy, we come from Carson Gracie. So... Back then, they, they already have a logo, which is a, was a baby with the dump, with the, uh, with the diapers and yeah. the black belt. It's a pretty good logo, and I really fall in love with that logo. It was like uh, Rodrigo Medeiros' dad that developed, God bless his soul, he developed that logo. 
And we were like, oh, man, that's awesome, you know, because back then we were just kids, you know, 15 years old, 14 years old. We didn't have no bulldogs or no uh, snakes or anything like that. The idea is like, you, you got, Rodrigo Medeiros that say, uh, Mr. Armando, right? Uh, Rodrigo, you only teach for a bunch of kids. Nothing more suitable than to have a baby with a pacifier and a <laughs> diapers and a black pouch. And guess what? That's the logo. The previous logo actually was a, a triangle choke, you know, a very famous picture triangle yeah. choke. And then uh, since we started to build up a lot of kids' program over there, they developed the logo. So anyway, long story short, last thing that you know, I attach my logo because of the Mr. of Machine, Mr. Shaggy, Daphne, and all the characters. And that's why <laughs> I actually like that. And the, the, the fact that uh, when I was rolling back then, you know, I was trying to be very sleepy with my moves and uh, coming here and coming there, you know. Back then I was quicker. Now I'm a little slower. Getting older, you, you, your speed is not the same, my friend. I'll tell you that. Uh, so you kind of like, you know, you develop like a little skills like to cut angles and stuff like that. And say, man, you move like a bull. Sometimes you hear, sometimes you say that. Boom, the last thing that you know, I have my logo attached to a, 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 a cartoon that I like it with the moves that I that I was doing it and that came out like that you know so just the, to the fact that somebody see a ghost on the logo you know that's my 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 brand my that's why we call Ghost Squad BJJ team yeah and uh, you know but that's that's all that's cool and I'll, and I'll put a link to, to your website is B-U-I-U B-J-J dot com and uh, you can go yes, there and, yes, and, and and you click on the news and events and that logo pops up. It's that's pretty cool. I like it a lot. Thank you, my friend. It's been a, a lot of fun talking with you today, and, and I've learned a lot, and I and I appreciate some of the ideas you shared with with us, and and uh, and we could take with us and, and train a little smarter and, and and get a little better at jiu-jitsu. I really appreciate you giving us the interview today. Oh man, pleasure was mine. I think the the best thing that happened in in in, in life in general is um, you cross paths with this amazing guy that it's always been supportive to me which is the one that actually uh, was be able to make this happen and I cannot mention him I cannot actually finish the, this interview if we finish like without mentioning his name which is a, a literally a guy that I actually grabbed by his arm and I told him you're going to do jujitsu with me I literally did that. He was a little chubby guy in Leblon, uh, Rio de Janeiro, and I used to eat a lot of candies. So now I have, uh, now I, now I have like a, a, a confession to say. So Andrea Monteiro, make this happen. <laughs> Andrea, thank you so much. You are, you're being a great guy for me. Andrea is not just my friend, but uh, we are, we are a friend's family. My mom, like I, I said in the beginning of this interview, my mom was a maid and until, my mom left uh, his house. My mom was working with uh, with her mom or with Andrea's mom, taking care of his little brother. You know, so my mom was part of the family. So me and Andrea, pretty much, we know each other for many, many years, and he always been supportive with my 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 daily basis dream. And you know, he always, man, we 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 want to try help you. You know, he's been he's been competing a lot, very successful, very guard player, very, very technical guy. And uh, I was be able to, very fortunate to be able to train with him so many, many times. Got myself smashed big time for him, learning with him a lot. And uh, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, really thank you for him to make this happen because, I mean, I don't see all the way around, you know, like uh, that, that I, I have this opportunity to talk about a little bit of myself you know, and uh, coming here, you know, and, and explain it to the jiu-jitsu community, like, a little bit about myself, you know, and Andrea make that happen, so I got to give a props to him. Yes, uh, and, and 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 I uh, definitely know Andre. He, he's the one who gave me my black belt, and, and uh, he was episode wow. four on this podcast, and we're well into the hundreds, so... Um, it is he's he's just he's a friend of you know he's a great coach great just a guy but he's a friend i consider him a friend and 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 i can tell you do too and he's just a nice guy and he's he's always willing to help out and and uh so I, that's great that we have a mutual friend in in andre montero 
just to finish, on, uh, my friend, I do have a blog in case yes. that, uh, you know, everybody wants to get interested. I, when I have a chance, of course, I try to build up this blog, so called Buyu Jiu Jitsu Team dot blogspot dot com. Buyu Jiu Jitsu Team dot blogspot dot com. So, uh, trying to get more like into the, the, that part of the social media. I'm just starting to, you know, surfing a little bit. And then, uh, you know, to try to write it down a little bit about like the daily basis, you know, that for, the, for sure for the next couple of months, in the next year, definitely, I'm trying to help out, especially the beginners. I think the beginners, they need a little bit of help, encouragement. And sometimes everybody just see like the, the higher belts or the competitors or the guys, they're going to go there. I think everybody in general, it's uh, very important to a dojo, to a club, to a a jiu-jitsu community, because if you make one person happy, I guarantee you that you're going to make 10 more people happy, you know? Yes, and uh, we'll put links to that as well on the on the show notes. And, Thank you. And, and definitely swing by and check out his blog. It's, he's going to have a lot of great stuff on there, and, and, uh, and i got to go oh, there now. So, <laughs> Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you, getting to know you. And, and, pleasure uh, is mine. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to you hearing you. guys have a great day, and I keep training. I hope everybody progress, and uh, hopefully one day I can meet you guys on uh, in the progress system, you know what I mean? So, And uh, any other tournament that you guys see around here, Miami, uh, Boca Raton Open, Miami Open, or Florida State, you know, shout out. All right. Well, thank you, and I uh, look forward to meeting you someday as, as well. And I know that hopefully some audience members will come in there and, and meet you soon. So thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, my friend. Take care. Yep. Bye-bye. Man, that was an awesome interview right there with uh, Michael Padeda. We really appreciate him coming on the show, uh, dropping some knowledge with us. Uh, uh, it's just going to help us all get better. Yep. I, I really enjoyed the part where he's talking about it, you don't just show techniques. You need to explain the techniques. You, I mean, there's a fair amount of talking being done uh, in jujitsu when you're teaching things properly. You know, anybody could, if you put it on mute and you watch, um, an instructional, okay, you could probably figure out how to do it, but you're, without the explanation of, of why things are happening and, and, and what this should feel like and, and, and how your body moves this way or that way, uh, there's a lot of value in that. And I, I really appreciate him mentioning that and, and bringing that in. And I also think that his in-house tournaments are a great tool, um, probably underutilized by the community, uh, to, uh, help people who want to compete have more success and help get some of those little nerves out um, as far as doing your, your competition. It could be your first competition or your 10th competition. You're still probably a little nervous. And if you do a few of those, you know, not a real big deal, but you kind of work it up a little harder. As like an in-house tournament, uh, you'll probably be a little less nervous and you'll probably uh, understand maybe the rules of the competition and the point system a little bit better than you would if you uh, are trying to figure that out uh, live. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah th- definitely. Yeah. Uh- you get a little more practice in. You, you get a, a more opportunities to, set, to get your feet wet in tournaments. And like you said, you just uh, uh, get more comfortable. But, you know, going back to what you were talking about earlier, um, not just show a technique, but explain technique. And that's what I really got out of it, too. And it seems like when I first started, I guess because jujitsu was kind of new in our area, we didn't really have, you know, it wasn't, it's never been a hot spot. It wasn't a hot spot. But uh, it seems like as time's going on, I was always a slow learner, and it seems like I think I was a slow learner because I was. It seems like more like techniques were shown. I, I didn't really understand the technique, and you know, people who explain techniques better help me understand it. And, and I, once I started seeing, you know, getting some instruction like that, my game totally changed. Uh, I like I said, I am a really slow learner, and I need. You can't just show me how to do it. I have to. I'm kind of thick headed, and I, I have to hear you know why i'm doing this you know little little different nuances of it and, and that i think has made a big difference in my game then yep it was, a, it was a fun interview and i i learned a lot there and i want to thank my training partner jeremy for uh hooking this interview up i really appreciate that and he he made some connections for me and and uh and that, he he did put he, he's helping uh he's I feel like he's part of the bj brick team here you know, uh, helping us out. And so uh, thank you for the support, Jeremy, and thank you for the connection. Yep, hey, thanks, Jeremy. We really appreciate it. 
Um, if you had a good time listening to this interview and the podcast, we would appreciate a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. So um, we hope we get a five-star review, but if not, that's fine. We have uh, thick enough skin to handle up to a three-star review without crying about it too bad. But uh, oh, I've it, cried on four. <laughs> Dang, Gary, that's sad, man. Well, I cry easily. Uh, well, yeah, yep. most of the, the pre-show pep talk is trying to get Gary to quit crying a lot of times and and, and usually the post show, Gary's trying to get me to stop crying about stuff. So, yeah, well, he's <laughs> crying because how bad I messed the show up. <laughs> but if you enjoyed the show, even with our little mess ups here and there, um, <laughs> you gotta be laughing. Uh, you could you could write us a review on you know wherever you listen to the reviews and wherever you write reviews. iTunes is the probably the biggest one, and uh, we'll send you out a BGJ brick gee patch, much like a, much like our award winning article this week will be uh, receiving if he reaches out to us um if you live in that, Byron, real quick yeah does jeremy have a gee patch i don't know he should he's getting a gee patch jeremy you're down with the gee patch sir yep and uh, i don't need to mail his out just just uh just remind me jeremy and i'll uh i'll have one in my gym bag just for you my friend hey can you talk the rest of the interview like that you've done that twice yeah now. gary i, I sure can <laughs> you like that man i do okay here we go we'll see if i can hold it up Okay. <laughs> um, hey, also, don't forget to check us out on social media. Uh, I know you always listen to us each week, but we also have a Facebook page. Uh, go in, post up to our Facebook page, uh, check it out. Uh, we're also on Twitter. We're not on Twitter as much as we're on Facebook, but we're definitely on Twitter, so check it out. Iron, are we on Instagram? I I, uh, I believe we have an Instagram account there. So, Byron's saying we have an Instagram account. So, hey, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, check us out, yeah. BJJ Brick. Most of your social media dot coms, we have those covered for you. And we'll be happy to bring those uh, right to you in the convenience of your own mobile device. <laughs> now you sound like an uh, uh, airline attendant. <laughs> well, fasten your seatbelts here. I'm going to tell you about next week's show. We have a uh, straight blast gym. Uh, guy, his name is Mark Fisher. He, uh, he contacted us after our interview with Kurt Osiander when I said if there's anybody who uh, has started or, or, or is involved with the community dealing with different sexual orientations in, in grappling, uh, let us know and, and, and we'd be happy to share the community with the audience. And, and he did that. So, uh, we talk about that. He's got a Facebook page called Roll Out and uh, we talk about that. And we also, uh, the last half of the interview, I, I, I got to get some coaching advice out of him. You know, it's it's from Straight Blast, and they always have uh, great. <laughs> They're advice. always awesome. So, yep. uh, So it's we got a Straight Blast guy. He's talking about rollout, and and it's a, it's a good way to to help. I think uh, just grow our entire community and to and to help our training environments become uh, better than they are. And that's that's what we're here for: better grow jujitsu, become better grapplers, better training environments. That's what we want. So, and if you're interested in that uh, sort of thing, go by and, and go to roll out. Go to facebook.com slash roll out jujitsu, all one word, and uh, it'll pop right up there. And if you can't find it, send me a message, and we'll we'll send you a link to that and uh, get you started there to try to get you some help and a little bit of support. Gary, yes, Byron. If if someone I can't do the voice anymore, I give up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> If, if someone's coming to Wichita, I really hope that they get a hold of us. You know, with this, with the Thanksgiving season coming in and, and going and Christmas coming around the corner, a lot of people are traveling. And if you're going to come to Wichita, Kansas, bjjbrick at gmail.com is your email address to send and we will find you a place to grapple. We will find a place. And as Byron said, you know, holidays coming up. A lot of people are traveling. If you do, give us a call, uh, give us a message. We will tra- we will train. Absolutely, that's always a, it's a good time, um, Gary. With the uh, kind of the show wrapping up here, most people are really wanting to get a copy of this next ebook you want you're going to be producing. You know, people were telling me I, I had a couple uh, emails sent to me that three three people three out of four people that sent an email said this is the the eighth best thing they like about each show. And I was trying to think, we don't even have like eight parts of each show. So I don't know if that's good or bad. But um, uh, at least three out of four people actually uh, 
acknowledged it. I guess that I could take that in a positive yeah. way there. And Gary, good news, man. The 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 fifth the fourth person said it was the seventh best thing we have going for us on the show. Ooh, so, so I did move up one. You moved so up one with bad. one person. And uh and, and five I'll out of four five out of four grapplers are gonna be buying this next ebook you're coming out with. It's called Ten Pounds, Ten Minutes, My Ten Step Process to Cutting Weight. So uh Gary, that is an impressive title and an impressive uh process you have that you could cut ten pounds of your weight in ten minutes. That's amazing. Yeah, you know the nice thing is to my e our ebook, audio book of ten pounds, ten minutes to the ten step process. Uh, <laughs> the nice thing about it is, I'm going to guide you through a way to lose ten pounds in three easy steps. <laughs> the other seven are basically really hard, or what? Well, no, it's really only three. Okay, but what looks better on a cover is ten, ten, ten than ten, three, three. Is this a, or is this 10, a, 10, 3. Yeah, that doesn't. 10, 10, 3 sounds terrible. Yeah, so, I mean, it just sounds horrible. But, you know, basically, you know what my most important process to lose 10 pounds in 10 minutes yeah. with three steps? <laughs> Step one, listen to the BJJ Brick podcast. Step two, buy yourself a ghee. <laughs> Step three, roll for 10 minutes. There you go. There you go. The the pounds will just shed off. That's my steps. And That's high tech. How much are you going to charge for this this ten 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 book? <laughs> oh, easily. Uh, just seven dollars and ninety nine cents. <laughs> Where else would I come up with that number? I don't know. I was hoping you. I think, mean, it just makes sense. That's true. You got to make sense with the change, anyway. Yeah, but I mean, I don't just take money. I just don't take U.S. currency. Bitcoins. Bitcoins are where it's at. That's what I'm asking for. For bitcoins on dot com. Yeah. I don't yeah. know I don't know much about bitcoins, but I've heard that they uh I don't have any in my wallet right now, Gary. Hate to say it. Well if you did, you could buy it. You Man. Know? So the ten pounds, ten minutes, ten step process, and I'm gonna teach you how to lose ten pounds in three steps. With only ten bit bitcoins. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ten plus ten plus ten is thirty. Ten plus three plus three is sixteen. 30 versus plus 16 is 46. Gary, See what I mean? Yeah, you're giving me a headache, man. This is very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we look forward to your weight cutting book and all the secrets you have. And, and if you apply these techniques for 20 minutes, you're going to probably put yourself in the hospital. Yeah, you know so I mean? don't that's take my much. advice. That's that's too much like a weight loss in, in too short of a time. But 10 minutes, Gary can teach you, and it's okay. It's pretty safe. Well, that, that sounds like an amazing book, Gary, and uh, I know everyone's just excited and, and waiting for, you know, in 10 weeks it probably will come out, and, and we'll, we'll be hitting, hit, everybody will be cutting weight very easily, so that's that's great. No, Gary. it's going to come out in three weeks, Byron. Three, oh, of course. Yeah, yep. Of course, Gary. <laughs> well, it's been, a, it's been a fun show here, and we're looking forward to the next week's show, of course, and uh, as always, stay sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to shower. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu.